Okay, doc. So, uh, good morning and uh, good evening and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and welcome to this webinar on modern fracture diagnostics and tight up conventionals. Uh, my name is Matthias uh, Carlson, and I'll be introducing uh, Jackson, Kyle, and, and Brendan a little bit uh, uh, later. Uh, before we uh, get started with uh, the webinar, we just would like to remind everybody about a few logistical uh, items. Uh, first and foremost, we have more than 250 registered uh, participants. Uh, that means that uh, when we're using WebEx uh, events, uh, everybody is, uh, is muted by, uh, by default. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't ask uh, questions. So feel free to ask questions in the Q&A uh, chat box that you find to the lower uh, right. So there's two, uh, so you have the, the chat option and then you have the Q&A uh, chat box. So please use the Q&A um, uh, chat uh, chat box to the right. Uh, that makes it a little bit easier to just uh, have an overview of all the, the questions. The presentation today will be between 45 to uh, to uh, 60 minutes. Uh, will be uh, a very unique presentation in the sense that we'll actually have three different uh, presenters, um, and uh, we'll get a little bit back to that in in a, in a second. And uh, worth noting is that uh, the session is and will be uh, uh, re, uh, recorded and also distributed after uh, the uh, the webinar on LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, um, and also on Whitson uh, Academy. Uh, Whitson Academy is just our online learning platform uh, that you can find on academy.whitson.com, where we provide uh, some of our uh, our uh, courses, both in a, a live manner, but also in a pre-recorded uh, manner. Um, so example courses on Whitson Academy is, for instance, related to what uh, we at Whitson do as a company. So, uh, for instance, PVT, gas EOR, and gas condensate uh, reservoirs. Uh, and worth mentioning is that we try to cater for all the different levels uh, from beginner to uh, to expert uh, on that uh, platform. Some of the live courses that's coming up for uh, uh, next year is already on our web page. You can find that on Whitson.com slash training. Uh, and also upcoming webinars after this uh, is also on the same uh, page, witson.com slash uh, training. So there, the next one is actually already in uh, in uh, December, uh, also with focus on some um, unconventionals uh, in, uh, in general. Uh, on that note, I'm very, very happy and excited to, uh, to uh, introduce the speakers uh, today. Uh, today we have Jackson, Kyle, and, and Brendan uh, with us. Uh, that are um, all people that have worked on the forefront of uh, called modern uh, fracture diagnostic technology uh, the last uh, decade. Uh, most of their uh, professional uh, career, uh, they've uh, been working for uh, for uh, Devon after they finished very respectful uh, degrees at the, uh, the institutions that you see here on the on the screen. Uh, so uh, on that note, I'll just uh, want to wish both uh, Jackson, Kyle, and and Brendan, welcome, and uh, I'll make you a uh, presenter, Kyle, and I think we should, uh, after that, be ready to get uh, get going. Thank you for the introduction, Matthias. I appreciate it. Thanks to, to Whitson for hosting the, these events and asking Devin to share. Originally, Matthias was, was looking for some completion diagnostic discussion, so I instantly knew to to go to two of the gurus inside Devon, Brendan and Jackson. So appreciate them taking the time to put this information together. All three of these segments are going to be new. We haven't shared this externally as a as a package. It's a sneak peek to what we'll be presenting at the FRAC conference in February. So if you're unfamiliar or haven't attended, I strongly recommend the SB Hydraulic Fracturing Technology Conference February first through third. It's in the woodlands. A lot of great papers, a lot of great work coming out there. As Matthias said, title is fracture or modern fracture diagnostics, specifically in tight unconventionals. High level outline, we're gonna look at a novel stress shadowing measurement. We'll look at net pressure from a couple of unique diagnostics. We'll talk about seal well borne, how it ties to strain monitoring. Jackson's got some really neat work on evaluating reactivation. Most of the wells that we're completing today are, are near uh, pre-existing fractures. Uh, so we're, we're looking at some of the diagnostics to try to evaluate new rock versus reactivation. And then Brendan's working on his PhD. 
down in Austin, and he's doing a lot of work on modeling the strain responses we're seeing and, and relating that back to the sealed well bore pressures that are being recorded. Brendan, can I get a thumbs up? Everything coming through loud and clear? See the picture good? All right, we'll jump in. First one, this is going to be the novel diagnostic setup for the purpose of measuring stress shadowing and then relating that back to net pressure. So what we have on this well bore, we're looking at a single well bore that has permanent fiber. The optical fiber is strapped to the outside of the casing, cemented in place. You, sh you interrogate that fiber optic cable similar to telecom uh, with a light pulse, a laser, and we'll get tens of thousands of measurements every second. The natural imperfections in, in the fiber optic cable result in backscatter of that light, and then you interrogate, interpret that light uh, to calculate the, the strain rate that we'll be talking about quite a few times today. As you stretch that glass fiber, it changes the shape of that, that cable significantly and the backscatter changes, and that's how we're relating it back to fracture intersections. There's a lot of other use cases for fiber that we won't touch on today. Along with permanent optical fiber on this well, we also had six bottom hole pressure gauges. And these gauges were located at three segments along the lateral. At each segment, we had one gauge that was ported inside the casing. So strapped on the outside of the casing, but it was measuring pressure inside the casing. And then at the same location, we had a gauge me measuring the reservoir side. The focus of this study is going to be the, the pressure gauge shown here near the toe of the well and the gauge that's ported inside the pipe is the focus. That gauge was positioned above the heel most cluster of the first stage and right below the plug, the frac plug that separates stages one and two. It's important to note that we were unable to use stage two for measuring this stress shadow poor elastic response because between stages you have to pump the ball or pump the frac plug down and then you drop a ball and pump the ball down that induces a pressure transient into the system at this toe gauge that made it difficult to use for the purpose of stress shadowing so the data we'll look at are going to be from stages three through nine and if you imagine driving nails into a board if you drive too many nails too close to one another that rock starts to split differently as you induce a stress away from that crack that you're creating with the nail. We're gonna to try to measure how much force these fractures are creating in the far field at different distances. There's uncertainty in which fracture that we're stimulating in the active stage is the actual source of the poor elastic response. So you'll see that we're gonna solve it in three different ways, assuming three different distances. And the distances are colored here. We'll stick with these colors throughout. The, the toe most or deepest cluster in the stage is shown here. So that's gonna be the minimum distance between the active stage and the monitor location. The, the mid distance is this middle cluster and then the largest distance would be if the heel cluster in the active stage is responsible for that stress shadow that we're measuring in the toe gauge, uh, that's gonna be the maximum distance. Luckily at the time, these were very short stages. So there's not a lot of uncertainty. They're only 150 feet long with five clusters. We also had, again, permanent fiber, so we have some idea as to which fractures were accepting the majority of the fluid. So as, as we complete these stages here, the, the idea is you're creating that perpendicular force away from the fracture face that you're growing out from the well bore. And we're trying to measure that because if you can measure it at multiple points, you can solve back to the pressure in the fracture, which is net pressure. So let's take a look at some of the actual data. Image on the right shows three different lanes. The top lane is the bottom hole treating pressure for a stage being stimulated. The middle lane, this is the bottom hole pressure that we were talking about in stage one, above the heel cluster, below the plug. This is our sensing point for the amount of stress shadowing we have. A couple of things to note here, you can see instantaneously. As soon as the pressure starts going up on treating pressure, we're injecting fluid into the well, we're starting to propagate a fracture, and we see the pressure response on that toe gauge instantly. And we should. They're, they're measuring from and exiting from the same well bore. So there should be no time, time delay. The other thing you'll note is there's a solid green line extrapolated with a negative slope throughout the stage. 
when calculating the true delta P of a poor elastic response, it's really important to understand what would have my pressure have been if I did not interact with that monitoring point early on. So we have to extrapolate the actual leak off prior to the intersection and then calculate the delta P at the end of the stage between the what would have been pressure and the actual. Uh, and it, it'll make a significant difference in that delta P. So for this example, we had about 100 PSI magnitude of a coral elastic or stress shadowing response. Another benefit here was all the stages were the same. Same cluster architecture, target rate, fluid viscosity was constant, mesh size distribution was the same. There was a slight variation in total slurry volume pump just because of some operational challenges getting to rates. So to account for the variability in volume pumped, we sampled this delta P at 7,000 barrels for every stage. So stages three through nine, three through nine that we'll look at all had between 7,000 and 7,500 barrels of total slurry pumped into the stage. What you can also notice here is this poor elastic response is continuing to increase over time. So without changing viscosity, without changing rate, just additional volume will impact net pressure. So that is why we made sure to sample at a consistent volume to get a good comparable data set to try to solve back to zero distance and understand net pressure. So this is one stage zoomed in again, treatment data, monitor data, and then calculated magnitude on the bottom. So zooming out a little more, let's look at five stages. And if you're a, a pressure nerd, you're probably gonna ooh and ah. It's a really a beautiful data set to see this nice consistency and each pressure magnitude bump and then fall off, a smaller magnitude bump and fall off. And that continues on because we're marching away. Each stage is moving further and further away from the monitoring point. So the stress shadow impact is gonna be less with distance increasing between the two points. And you can see that just visually, uh, the solid line is calculated in this program we use and then measuring that delta P, you can see that magnitude fall off from more than 120 PSI and within five stages, you're down near 40 PSI. Again, just highlighting the consistency in the frac design. This is key if you're changing rate, viscosity, and a lot of other knobs, these magnitudes will vary significantly and pulling this clarity from this a data set like this would be very difficult. So five clusters, 80 barrels a minute, high visc FR with about eight centipoise, and we were 50, 50, 100 mesh and 40, 70 problem. So then after we calculated, we measured a delta P for stages three through nine, we tried to take into account the uncertainty I mentioned before in which cluster, which fracture being propagated was responsible for that pressure response. So what we have is semi-log scale here, uh, pressure magnitude calculated, which we just talked about on the X on top, and then distance from fracture to monitor on the Y. And the reason we have three points now for each magnitude, you can see all the magnitudes are gonna be the same for each stage. There's no uncertainty there, we measured it. The uncertainty lies in which fracture was responsible. So maximum distance, these triangles represent if the heel cluster propagating was the source of that response. And then the circles represent if the tomos cluster, the closest one, was responsible for that response. Honestly, playing around in Excel, looking at different trend lines, we found that logarithmic trend lines describe this relationship between the different stages very well. So we use the logarithmic trend line to then solve for the distances between the data points that we have. And that's what we have here. So we used logarithmic relationship, developed three equations, and the image on the right is full of a lot of very valuable information. First one is the red triangles. These are the same points that we're talking about over and over again. These are measured data points from high fidelity downhole pressure gauges, very tight tolerance on the uncertainty of the distance, 150 foot stage length. We had fiber to confirm we weren't getting any leak by, no plug failures, no backside isolation issues. We knew we were propagating fractures from the desired stage. So each of the red points are measured delta P's, stress shadow measurements at 7,000 barrels. And then another note that's really interesting is when you pump a DFID, a very common output is your process zone stress, which is simply ISIP minus closure. 
Uh, same equation for net pressure, so a lot of ways to say the same thing. But if you plot the net pressure from the DFIT, which is going to be, if you think about distance from fracture face, your net pressure exists inside your fracture, so it's at a zero distance. You plot that on this, on these three curves that we've solved for, accounting for that uncertainty and distance, and you can see the, the net pressure from the DFIT falls right in between the range of outcomes that we calculated using this poroelastic measurement technique. Again, each curve represents a different distance. Uh, what you can do is look at the x-axis, move some distance away from the fracture face and then up, and that intersection point is gonna tell you the pressure that you would expect to sense away from the fracture face at that distance. So going to zero and up, the main takeaway from this plot here is our net pressure in this area ranges from 170 to 220 PSI. One of the many things Brendan's working on down in Austin is trying to model some of these responses. So if we overlay a model that's calibrated to these pressure responses, you can start to see how the pressure changes, not only at the tip where you have that reduction in stress that allows your fracture to continue to propagate, but how does that pressure change as a function of distance from your fracture place? So overlaying this plot now, right on the zero line, uh, vertically placed is the hydraulic fracture that's propagating. And then as you move away from that fracture left or right, with distance, that pressure's falling off. The warmer color is higher pressure, the cooler color is a negative and lower pressure. And, and we can use these measurements from the field like this to calibrate models like Brendan's working on and start to learn a lot about how to design the, the optimal cluster spacing, prop and size, a lot of those things to calibrate your other frac models as well. But there's other tools, and Jackson and Brendan are going to talk a lot about strain, but let's take a look at another way to use some of the field diagnostics like strain rate to understand the impact or the size of your stress shadow region. So this is actual data. This is uh, the first well that came in here, the solid black line. Imagine that's the well propagating the fracture. This is the same area, same unit with fiber, and we had a single cluster stage to control uh, the outcome easier to interpret. So a single cluster stage, and as that's, that single cluster propagated in the far field, it intersected a fiber optic well, and this red area shows that fracture intersection, and all of the blue shows that stress shadow region. So you can see we're using the, the length of the compressional lobe to calibrate to the stress shadow region in this model shown in the background. To highlight a little a little more as to why we need to look at both near well worn far field, here's an example of a fiber well being completed. At a high level, if you have noise, the red represents noise, and you can see noise exists at every cluster. Clusters on the left, depth increasing from top to bottom, time increasing from left to right. Our frac data is on bottom here. Uh, rates black, pressure's blue, and then a stair step or your prop concentrations both surface and downhole. The main takeaway here is if you look at this waterfall plot, we see acoustic signal or activity at every cluster throughout the stage. This looks great. Five clusters at 25 foot spacing. We're effectively distributing our slurry across the, the well bore at the near well bore. But it's important to look in the far field. Tools like cross well strain, like offset pressure sealed well bore, they give you insight into how do these fractures change as you move away from the well bore. So that same five cluster 25 foot design, now looking at the arrival 600 feet away from a fiber optic well, what we see is we have two of the fractures arrive. First fracture arrives very early on. On the bottom, we're showing the treatment data in the first lane, and then the offset pressure, the sealed well bore in the second lane, and the derivative of that sealed well bore in the third. So we can see compression, tension compression on the strain, which is the telltale sign that you have a fracture arrival. You're stretching the cable at the aperture and compressing the rock on either side. We propagate that dominant fracture for a majority of the stage. About the last third of the stage, we, we see a shift. So we see the fracture that's growing, opening, uh, switch polarity from red or tension to blue, which is uh, compression. So it's now closing. The fracture that was growing stopped growing, stopped propagating. And at the same time, a new fracture at a new depth about 75 feet away, so we had a cluster gap in between those two, we see a new fracture arrive. And all this to say is near well board doesn't tell the full story, far field doesn't tell the story, full story. You need to have both of them to understand what's going on. 
And what we see here is, I, I would throw it out to the audience, are the fractures competing for width? We only have so much width available to create within some length of rock. And at the same time, we see one fracture die off, we see the next fracture arrive. So imagine these things are dynamically changing the way they're growing out in the reservoir. And you need the right set of diagnostics to understand how these changes occur. So again, VFR, you'll hear that quite a few times. That's simply the volume pumped into the treatment well when that first response is identified on the offset. Regardless of the diagnostic you're using, strain or sealed well bore, that VFR is a nice metric to, to track. And then this next line, that's just identical. We're showing again, second fracture arrival. If you go down and look at the sealed well, we see a second inflection. So looking for, at the same time, these nice diagnostics like fiber, I would love to have it on every well. It's not scalable, it's not cost effective. So we, we try to find alternatives or diagnostics that can uh, complement what strain and other fiber tools provide at a lower cost that allows the tools to be more scalable. Opening and closing fracture signature. High level conclusions, it's a novel pilot. And honestly, we didn't go out trying to measure this. This is not why we put the gauges where we placed them. Brendan, I think it was six, nine months after we had collected this data, the diagnostic was behind us, kind of clicking around. We were playing in seek and we started seeing these things pop. So I can promise you, if you don't design a diagnostic pilot, you'll never have these aha moments. And if you do, I can promise you, you won't always see them. But going out there, collecting the data, it's making sure your teams have time to, to look into it, to brainstorm, to pick it apart, look at it different ways. It's a good chance that if you go collect high quality data, you're gonna learn a lot and you're gonna learn more than you set out to, to go measure. Uh, in this case, the DFIT net pressure, ISIP minus closure from the DFIT aligned very well with the measurements that we, uh, we saw back using this stress shadow technique. The cross wall strain we just looked at, it confirms that fractures do compete for width and they can't always grow simultaneously. Tighter than minimum cluster spacing. So we can talk about minimum cluster spacing based on geomechanics. That can work. And that can work because fractures will start and stop. They don't all have to grow at the same time throughout the entire stage. And for this area, this is in Oklahoma, uh, net pressures range from 165 to 220 PSI. And that's it's really important to note that this is going to be specific to formation, to fluid design. This is not everywhere all the time. It's important to get this measurement uh, in your own area. It's key for model calibration, then using again to optimize cluster spacing, fluid type, propent size. Uh, this is a, a number that historically in unconventionals has been a little more difficult to come by. So that's all I have for the first section. I'll turn it over to Jackson. Thanks, Kyle. You can uh, hear me all right there? Awesome. Um, so my portion is titled, Did We Break New Rock? And it's focusing on when we have these uh, cross wall strain monitors, be it fiber optic DAS data or seal level pressure monitoring. Um, how can we differentiate new fractures reaching the monitor versus re stimulation of um, pre existing fractures? Uh, Kyle, if you go to the next slide. So, I want to start out with kind of a simple example of where we're pretty confident in kind of what we're seeing and what's going on. So, this is a single stages um, cross wall strain monitoring. So, we're seeing data from the monitoring well bore. We have an active stage completing a few hundred feet away. And the, the rate data for that active stage is kind of at the bottom of the image there in white. And so for this one stage, um, we're looking at time relative to stage start on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we're looking at um, about 1,000 feet of that fiber monitor, so 1,000 feet or so of measured depth. And I have a horizontal line there um, dashed, marked out. And that's where a previous stage of this stem well um, had intersected this fiber monitor. So you can see there's a little bit of closure very early on in, in this image. Um, so we just want to mark that out so we know we already have a fracture present. So stage starts, um, you can see just about 10 minutes in where I've marked with the red plus sign, we get our first, um, what we believe to be this kind of re-dilating of that pre-existing fracture. And it takes about another 30 minutes for the more kind of typical um, fracture rivals to show up marked out there in green. And you'll notice a few things. One, so the reactivation is faster, nine versus 38 minutes. Um, another thing you'll notice is it has kind of a different character and I'll show some other examples of this, but just kind of quickly, you don't see this leading um, tensional front heart shaped kind of process zone stress before the arrival. And you have much more muted compressional lobes um, of that reactivation compared to the normal arrivals, uh, which those, those three different fractures uh, have showing up. 
So that's what it looks like in low frequency DAS. Um, this is what it looks like in seal well bore. So in the same well that um, has the fiber optic cable, we also have a downhole gauge uh, monitoring the pressure change within that well bore. So seal well bore pressure monitoring. Um, and that's that dark gray line. The kind of pre-stage fall off of that pressure, I have fit with a linear trend. So you can kind of see that. And where that reactivation occurs, um, you can see there is a slope change in that seal wellbore pressure. And this is something we've kind of realized that we've gotten more of these data sets to compare seal wellbore to fiber. Really anything we're seeing in the fiber optic data in the DAS, um, it manifests in the seal wellbore. It's just kind of understanding that, that signature. Um, so in this case, we can see it's kind of the slope change. And then when the actual fracture uh, first started arriving, you can see the seal wellbore pressure has this much more intense kind of inflection and um, pressure build. And so, Kyle, I think if you click um, two times, two little things will pop up there. Yeah, so kind of when we're just looking at seal wellbore data, we're trying to see these kind of different characters of the responses to ID where this reactivation could be occurring um, versus these new fractures arriving. So kind of a slope change, more muted strain response um, for the reactivation versus a more pronounced kind of inflection uh, pressure build and then rollover at the end of the stage for, for new fractures actually arriving uh, in seal wellbore. And this example um, is kind of where we first were seeing reactivations fairly often. Um, it kind of makes sense, you know, we're seeing the previous stages cluster that was closest to the active stage. Um, somehow we're interacting with it. So, you know, this could just be behind casing communication um, between different damage zones to the adjacent stage, um, or this could be in the far field somewhere where we're actually having a new fracture intersect this prior stages fracture and, and reopen it. Uh, you can go to the next slide there, Kyle. So this is an example now where the reactivation is a lot more intense um, and kind of is occurring across the entire new stimulated interval we're targeting. So I'll start out in the, in the left where we have a map view. Um, we had a triple zipper leading this, so that would be the uh, green, red, and dark red wells there. Um, all the past microseismic events are the small gray dots, the active stage, um, is that large green square and those micro seismic events are colored. All the horizontal lines you see is as this zipper was going toe to heel from north to south, um, where there was initial intersections on the fiber monitor that's marked out there um, by M. So that M is the fiber monitor. I'm showing about 100 minutes of its crosswell strain DAS data there um, for during this stage, just kind of around that wellbore so you can see it. And I was making these picks based on the kind of criteria I just talked about, kind of the character of that fiber optic response to say, yes, these look like the new fracture arrival. So you can see kind of where they're all at. And you can see our active stage is kind of right in line with where both the red and dark red wells have had a bunch of prior intersections. You can see kind of it's all overlapping um, where it's lighting up there on the fiber monitor. Um, so Kyle, if you go to the right plot now. So this is a kind of mirrored RT plot. So um, Everything on the right half of the image is looking at minutes since stage start for this stage, and the y-axis is distance um, easterly, so towards the fiber monitor. The left half of the plot is only looking at data um, west of the fiber monitor, so growing towards the parent. It's kind of how we were trying to, to break out the data. So just focusing on the right half, um, what I have is the kind of initial, where we picked the initial fiber response is marked out by that larger green dot, and that's occurring um, at the correct distance from the stem well to the monitor on frac asthma. So those two wells are around, uh, I think, 1,600 feet apart. And that's marked out there with that dot. Yeah, thank you. Um, so at that distance, I also took a, about 1,000 feet measure depth window of the fiber data and just hung it at that distance. So we can see as this fracture and, and the entire kind of um, fracture network is propagating out uh, over time, when it reaches that fiber monitor, what are we seeing on, on the DAS? Um, that pick. We use a square root of volume relationship with distance to take the kind of picked response and try to um, extrapolate and interpolate between our stem well to our monitor where that leading edge of the fracture is over time. So you can see that there marked out by the green line and how most of the micro seismicity is falling um, kind of right along that edge of that. So we're seeing pretty good agreement between what our micro seismic is showing and fiber monitor showing where the leading edge of this um, reactivation and, and new fracture growth uh, is occurring. Um, so Kyle, if you could zoom back in uh, on the fiber monitor, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit more. Uh, yeah, on the right plot there. Sorry. Thanks. Um, so 
all the horizontal lines you're seeing in that image are where those previous intersection points had occurred from stages prior to this active stage. And I started out with the color bar um, really squeezed, so it's, things are really pronounced, and you're seeing uh, about six or so of these prior intersection points are the first things that start lighting up, and they have, uh, again, that kind of more muted response in the fiber data. And then, Kyle, you could um, go to the next slide, and um, it will change colors a little bit and, and zoom in. And so I started out with the color bar really squeezed, so you could see those um, really clearly. And now, if you kind of loosen up the color bar, it starts to break things out a little bit differently. And you can really clearly see these reactivations are a lot more muted when compared to the real arrival. So I've marked the reactivations with plus signs, um, the, what looks like the more typical crosswell strain new fracture arrivals with green Xs. And um, kind of like the previous example, you can notice they're slower to get over there. You know, it's propagating a new fracture instead of redilating some pre-existing um, fracture network in, in failed media. And then you also notice, again, that, that character is a little bit different. Um, so Kyle, if you go to the next slide, I'll have a little bit zoomed in on that character. So if you look at the kind of reactivation in the top plot, um, you'll see it's really this narrow zone. You don't have this heart-shaped um, process zone stress leading, that tensional front leading the arrival. It's just kind of a uh, tension that occurs with very little compression, very little blue on either side showing that kind of far field impact. Um, while when you look at the new fractures arriving that I've marked with, with the green box, you can actually see that heart shape um, and you can see much more pronounced compression and that, that actual stress impact um, occurring a few hundred feet away from the from the actual fracture intersection. Um, you go to the next slide there, Kyle. So just thinking through kind of like what, what does this mean and, and what's going on and, and why this matters, um, this is kind of be the setup where you can imagine we had a prior well uh, where it was fracking and created fractures that we know reached the monitor well bore marked out by those, those red dashed lines and, and the red lines on the um, image of, of the DAS. And so those are, you know, once we start pumping immediately opening up, and really, it's just in between those pre-existing fractures where the clusters that are initiating in these kind of undamaged um, intervals are actually able to grow across and reach those, uh, reach the fiber monitor as this kind of new fractures growing. And seeing this has kind of opened up a lot of interesting questions to, to think through. Um, you know, can can we avoid this? You know, is this unavoidable? And of great interest is like, where's the sand going, right? We, we try and understand where the propens going when we're creating a new fracture. Um, it's going to be even harder to understand if we're not um, necessarily having that normal process and instead we're pumping into a high perm pathway. You know, where is our propen actually going in these reactivation stages? Uh, Kyle, you can go to the next slide. And so this is the last example I have and um, kind of started out with DAS and seal well bore. Um, showed just a DAS only example and now this is just seal well bore only. And so this is a um, separate data set. I'll start out with the, the left plot. So this is also an RT plot. So a single stage, um, x-axis is time since stage start. The uh, rate data is there just at the bottom of the image for reference for where um, stage start and end times are. At the correct distance away from the stem well, well A, to the monitor well, well B, which is about 1,200 feet away, um, I have hung the seal well bore pressure. And um, you can see where I've marked the kind of first arrival there with that green X, and I've bolded um, some window around that arrival just to kind of highlight the character of that seal wellbore response, showing that kind of typical inflection of a normal fracture arriving. Um, so the example on the right now is where we are kind of at the end of a development, so we know we have lots of uh, row developments, so we have lots of child fractures present, and we're also offsetting a um, unit depletion, so we know we have parent fractures uh, also present. And I have these dashed lines to mark out where the initial seal wellbore trend is um, kind of prior to stage start. And Kyle, if you click, um, I'll have marked out where we go from that initial trend to a initial inflection where we think we're having that reactivation that's moving more rapidly through the reservoir and has a different strain response. It's more of a slope change um, on the seal wellbore pressure monitor. And then the actual inflections marked out by green, which is a slower process as those new fractures are growing, reaching the monitor and causing these more um, pronounced inflections. So the DAS data has been really great for us to try to back into and, and understand how to interpret the seal wellbore data, which we have a lot more prevalently, and try to get into um, what's what's going on in a case like this. Um, so you go to the next slide, Kyle. So to summarize, there's um, certain things we're looking for to understand on these crosswell strain monitors, what's new fracture growth versus reactivation, um, the, the rapidity of the arrival, the kind of character of the response in, in different diagnostics, and then the presence of pre-existing um, fractures. So I only showed examples with um, child and, and 
in parent fractures maybe in the unit, we've also seen um, similar behavior when we have faulting or you know really any failed media that can be a high perm pathway to get over to a monitor well bore. Um, a lot of the times we're collecting this diagnostic data ultimately to calibrate frac models and try to simulate what's going on as we're producing these units. So accurately capturing um, and cataloging what's a new arrival versus a reactivation um, we're realizing has been it's really important because you can have at times very unrealistic geometries if you treat these reactivations as new fractures actually reaching your monitor. Uh, and then kind of just thinking through what all this could mean for our developments, had some interesting um, kind of thoughts. You can potentially try to describe if you're having plug slip versus behind pipe communication based on the kind of reactivating that you're seeing relative to prior stages. Um, and then how to actually mitigate if we have depleted fractures from parents versus undepleted child fractures present, are there different things we could do? Um, what can we control in the near well bore to maybe um, reduce the impact of certain clusters potentially unavoidably are going to be pumping into pre-existing uh, fractures. And that is everything uh, on my part, Kyle. Great. So thanks, Jackson. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in, in more of the research space to measure and model these well bore deformations and strain. And I really like the last you know, example Jackson gave showing kind of how we're starting to interpret the differences of a reactivation or a sealed well arrival. And, and this work is basically um, trying to really give a distinct character and definition to some of these sealed well responses. So I can go ahead and go to that next slide. Um, this is essentially the, the four buckets of, of the research effort of what, what we're doing, you know, paired with UT. But uh, you know the, the minimal model here is you know fracture growth leads to deformation in the formation and on the casing as well. So that leads to a volume change or a, or a volume reduction in your casing. It gives you a pressure increase at the surface. So that's essentially what we're trying to mimic and, and simulate here. And to do that, you know we can do some testing on um, some actual five and a half you know pub joints and look at the stress and strain relationships as well as how much that pipe needs to deform given a certain strain signature. Um, we can look at our analytical models that, that give us a um, you know, estimate of displacement as a function of pressure and wall thickness. So that's a very common you know, pressure vessel design equation that can give us some um, you know, surface pressure change estimates. Then we can go to the numerical modeling space and, and actually grid up these um, fractures that are propagating in, in 3D space with a well bore that has a highly refined mesh around it and then that way we can extract strain um, in multiple directions out of the formation and out of the well bore itself. So that helps us tie a direct um, you know, strain observation to a physical deformation in the pipe. And, and that's essentially what we do numerically at the bottom of that third, third box is, is we can replicate these sealed well responses numerically by calculating the volume change that's, in, that's being induced by the propagating fracture on the well bore. And you know, that example down there just shows you a sensitivity to your, your casing size, so a 5,000, 10,000, or 15,000 foot lateral, you're going to expect a different pressure response and a response magnitude. So um, we're really starting to investigate all of this and understand more about the signals, the magnitudes, the slopes, um, just like what Jackson was showing earlier. And then, you know, at the end of the day, what's the point? We have to match our still data. We have to anchor to some real world observations so we can take these strain arrivals, the pressure, the civil pressure response that's being um, generated by the deformation of the casing and then try to not only tie the, the fracture history match um, model example to the real data, but it, you know, also characterize the formation, the leak off and the relaxation of these fractures, as well as the arrival times and everything um, as they intersect the well bore. So it's essentially taking that kind of fracture model uh, concept, you know, one level up and um, you know, that's, that's the research goal. So we'll dig a little bit more into that on the next few slides. Um, so, with um, the physical measurement of, of the strain response, you know, we can take our, our casing, install strain gauges on that casing, and load the casing in various ways with a load frame that can give us a, a load applied um, versus, you know, varying distances along the casing and, and gives us a resulting displacement and strain. And all we're really trying to do here is um, anchor these displacement estimates, and you can see here they're on the sub millimeter type um, type of deformations. And that's really all we're talking about is very subtle changes in the pipe diameter. But 
you know, that results in 40, 60, 80 micro strains that we can predict with the simulator. So if we have two animations here, Kyle, um, just click, yeah. So as we make a measurement on the pipe, we would expect a certain strain value fairly close to the fracture. And then one more, we can um, make another measurement that would um, be depicting this strain dissipation in distance along the casing. So that's essentially going to be this, you know, compression region on the pipe that we see that dissipates with distance, just like Cal and Jackson both showed earlier. And the next slide we'll look at, okay, yeah. And then that's just the, um, you know, de depicting the analytical model, the predicted hoop strain is that blue line. And then we can make these measurements and predict the strain uh, as we move away from the pipe. So all of the lab measurements are really um, honoring the, the field data that we've seen and the numerical simulations so far. So we feel really good about that. And then to, to take this to a very simplified, um, you know, kind of analytical model, we have these functions that, that can give us a displacement as a function of external pressure, properties of your, your pipe or your casing. Um, you know, and, and so as we stress this casing, we would expect a certain um, radius change or, or, or deformation in that casing. And then with that deformation and volume change, we can get this pressure increase through some really simple compressibility um, expressions. And, you know, just as an example here um, to kind of give everyone like a, a really, you know, nice visual, if, we, if we're loading the casing at a very small increment, just say one meter at a thousand pounds, you know, you're going to get a 0 0.025 PSI response at surface. If we load that same casing over a 10 meter interval, you know, you'd expect a 0.25 and then over a hundred meter interval, you'd expect a two and a half um, PSI response. So what this is telling us is, is effectively, you know, the magnitude of the sealed wall response that we see is totally a function of the volume change in your casing. And that volume change, you know, could be directed to, towards, you know, how much region of influence are we expecting? Does this tie to our fiber cross wall strain um, distances and, and everything like that. So, um, you know, with multiple inflections, you have multiple fracture arrivals and those multiple inflections could lead to additional volume change, which give us little inflections and humps in the sill wall signature. So we're really looking into this um, multiple different ways, simple models, lab measurements, and the next slide is going to be our numerical. Oh, sorry, I have one more uh, morsel here on the analytical side, but the, um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Kyle. Thank you. Yeah, so this is just the expected pressure response due to just a simple volume change instead of ha having to resolve varying distances of your loading. So this is just simply put, um, you know, it just ties that pressure to a direct volume change. And if we click a couple of slides, you know, what does it really take to generate a one PSI response here? So that's, you know, if we expect the pressure change to do one PSI, that's about 0 0.0025 meters cubed. And if you click two more times for me, you know, that's about one cup of volume change, you know, or your morning coffee to generate that type of response. So that's kind of what we're seeing down the hole over this 10,000 foot lateral is, is these really subtle changes um, over multiple regions of the casing. And that's where we're going to try to um, take into the numerical world, which is the next slide. Um, so I definitely want to give, you know, a huge shout out to the team at UT, especially Shuang um, and Dr. Sharma um, for helping with this. But, you know, we have these really advanced models that have been developed over the last 10 years that are, you know, fully coupled reservoir simulation, frac propagation, and uh, really new and novel ways to grid the reservoir. So we're gridding the monitor well bore, or the sealed well in this case, with highly refined meshes around the well bore, multiple divisions of steel casing, as you can see in red, and then fairly high resolution mesh around the well bore that represents the formation. And we can take these simulations. Yeah, go ahead and hit a couple of animations for me and depict the, the, the kind of deformation on that wellbore due to the fracture intersection. You get this kind of ovality, you get these changes in the wellbore behavior. And, you know, we can also see this in field data. So this is just um, a, a type of caliper log that, that, that can be ran that tells you you can get three or even up to 9% ovality in some instances for very severe casing deformation. Most of the responses that we see in the field are on the order of you know, 0.1 to 1 kind of PSI type range, and that's much more in the elastic range. So if you're seeing these really, really large um, sill wall responses, you might be approaching this kind of permanent deformation range, but, um, you know, one more animation, please. Yeah, and then that's what we're doing here, um, predicting these um, incremental pressure responses, giving various scenarios. So what we're doing is really trying to understand how big does this fracture need to be to generate this response? 
what is the net pressure inside that fracture, going back to Cal's, some of Cal's stuff. Can we simulate a, a redilation or new propagation? And what does that look like on these responses? So we're trying to tie all this together to develop this kind of coupled solution. And I think if we go to the next slide, yep. So the so obviously the next phase is to take this to real world data. You know, we can take these crosswall strain events. You know, there's a really clean waterfall plot uh, with a fiber crosswall strain arrival. We have that nice halo indicating propagation before the arrival, and then as the fracture intersects the well bore, we have this nice compression, tension compression signature, and then in the black line in the middle of the plot, that's the corresponding sealed well pressure. So basically, the fracture arrives at that well bore, causes the inflection. That's when the real volume change is happening inside that casing, and we want to take that to the modeling world and predict it. You know, on the on the very bottom left, we see um, our single cluster stage was pumped at 30 barrels a minute. Uh, you see the pump rate in blue there with their pressure response in orange. And then the very next stage, we went back to a normal design. So that's back at full rate, multiple fractures propagating. And you can really clearly see there how much of a difference the magnitude of that, of that response that we see. And, um, you know, when we go on the right side of this plot, when we capture this in the 3D simulations, you know, we're, we're looking at this induced fracture strain as, a, as the fracture propagates in the, in the formation, as well as the strain that induces on the casing. So it's kind of a coupled problem. It's the fracture and the formation moving that induces strain on our casings. And, you know, we just compute that volume change and then compute that well pressure response, and we can get that in time. And, and what you see here is just three dotted lines that are traced um, simulations, you know, the first one, maybe the blue one or the, or the yellow one is, uh, you know, a mismatch. The fracture arrived too early in the simulation. The leak off for the yellow curve is, um, you know, too aggressive. So that, that kind of depicts the relaxation of the fracture now and the reduction of strain on the casing. Um, but then the goal at the end of the day is really to just get this match and honored to your field data. So now you can resolve your fracture size, your, your arrival times are honored and the volume balance is honored. So. Um, that's where we're going, and that's kind of a sample for the, the frat conference paper that's coming out in February. And I think my last slide is just to wrap it up here. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, we're looking at these pressure responses, whether they're, you know, direct measurements or induced measurements, and it's always going to be a fundamental fracture diagnostic. And, and more often than not, likely one of the cheapest things we can do. Um, we always want to look to cross validate, you know, the pressure, the stress, and strain measurements. So, you know, I, I'm constantly encouraging our vendors and our, and our fiber providers to. Let's look for more direct links to a physical strain measurement when we look at our fiber data. How do we tie that to a actual formation deformation or a pipe deformation? Um, you know, there's definitely new insights on what Jackson was showing with the, the new rock versus redilation. I, I think we're seeing more and more of that these days. And then, um, you know, some of the work on the research side is, you know, these propagating factors induce a deformation and strain on the monitor well, whether it's sealed well or fiber optics, uh, it's measurable and, we, and we're interpreting it. And, um, you know, this can lead to great insight and fractured behavior. So, you know, I guess we'll leave the last bit of time to, to the questions and really thank you for your time and participation today. Great. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, we have a few uh, questions here uh, that we'll uh, get to, but um, I'll, I'll start with some of the more um, generic or uh, or broad questions in terms of how this, uh, you know, you all have worked on this type of technology for a long time now. And uh, is there something that you've seen kind of the findings uh, of this, uh, these technologies have uh, changed the mental models and how you model some of these uh, things from a reservoir perspective uh, internally at, uh, at uh, Devon, or is it still something we are kind of trying to, to, uh, to decipher and, and, uh, uh, find, uh, I guess, uh, workflows and whatnot uh, that is uh, more or less uh, benchmarked and, uh, and a consensus. But Matthias, I'll take the first half and ask, ask Brendan to dive into the, the way he's using it to calibrate. I think one of the big differentiators that Seal Wellbore has offered us is we've got 11,000 stages monitored now. So just the sheer volume of data has allowed us to understand the statistical variab variability of fracture growth rates across basins, across depletion, no depletion, reactivation, non-scenarios. Uh, and then with that database, and I'll kick it over to Brendan, he can speak to how he's using that to calibrate the fracture models, which feed the full subsurface workflow. 
Yeah, so so basically we'll take these, you know, kind of known growth rates that we've developed from multiple monitoring projects and multiple different basins and and the growth rate follows relatively speaking a square root of time relationship and we can take that and and make sure the fracture model is honoring these arrivals in in 3D space. So if the fracture is crossing this well bore, you tie it and make sure your volume balance is is adhered when it arrives there and then maybe on a secondary well or whatever like that. And then um that ensures we're honoring this hydraulic geometry, this this broken rock and this deformed rock mass. And then you have to take that to maybe something with interference testing or child pressure group to understand the effective and conductive portions of that fracture. Cause because we're not producing from these 1500, 2000 foot fractures. It's um it's gonna be a subset of that. And that's really important to to take and to understand when we when we make these observations of really long fractures. Maybe that's not always the case that we're producing from the total total length. Matthias, the other piece, you know, ask Jackson to speak to, but I've seen the way we visualize data change so dramatically in the last three years. And a lot of it thanks to Jackson, his ability to manipulate data and, and create custom visuals. I think telling the story with the data has also been a huge game changer to help Brendan calibrate models. Uh, but the, the visuals have improved rapidly because we've been able to see so many data sets and get so many kicks at the cans. Jax, if you want to speak a little bit to just the, the advancement of diagnostics and the benefit of repetition. Yeah, I think th the best example I have is when I first joined Devon, we're developing the Antarctica Basin. And um, as we started collecting this data and looking at it, just realizing how far off we were on just even like how long our fractures are. You know, we had these mental models of, of not huge um, hydraulic half lengths and, and started to see pretty quickly that actually we have just really massive, massive geometries. And like Brendan was saying, um, it's only a certain portion of that geometry that we're actually able to produce from. And I think looking back at some of that, you know, reactivation data we showed, um, it's just kind of supporting that, that lots of fractures that we're creating that, you know, we might not be producing from or that we're interacting with. And um, that, that part's been really, really interesting um, putting all the data together. Awesome. And the, you, you mean, uh, Kyle, you spoke a little bit to uh, the fact about having you know a large data set and whatnot and that makes makes uh, it more fun and probably also more challenging in many ways but in terms of if you go back five years eight years uh, kind of the mental models that uh, I guess we all had in the industry back then versus kind of the some of the learnings you 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 gotten from this maybe something else as well r related for instance these hydraulic test size has there been like like some surprises is there some huge surprises for you uh, we we've discussed like frack heights for instance earlier uh over coffee is, is it something along those lines that you think uh was a kind of an eye opener for for you or or any of the the other uh, panelists yeah i'll start height especially permian height has been for me personally a a surprise at least you know hfts2 there's a lot of data sets now published and released there are measurements of upwards of 1,500 feet of hydraulic height growth in the Permian, which five years ago, if you would have told me that, I, I would have struggled to believe you. But with some of these diagnostics, the way they've advanced, they provide a lot more certainty in the measurement. They're a direct measurement, not trying to uh, back calculate what something in, in the far field may be related to. This is a direct measurement of deformation on a fiber optic cable, for example. So yeah, height's a big one. And then the change in the size of our conductive geometry as a function of drawdown and time would be another one that five years ago, I, I personally didn't have uh, much understanding or an appreciation for, or the, the data collection techniques to go understand it either. Brendan Jackson. Yeah, I might just elaborate on some of that height component. You know, again, it just goes back to the hydraulic is in, in very well should be different than your your conductive geometry and you know even though you see some frack hits in certain cases it may not always be detrimental so um i think really focusing your efforts on on trying to understand that difference is going to be kind of a, a really big game changer in the next few years um and i think we're still very early in the learnings and true understanding but um, just capturing and understanding those differences uh, is very key looking at pinch points looking at lithology changes and how those um, can isolate you bench by bench. So, um, but yeah, all good points. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, I think 
the heterogeneity of, of fracture geometry has been pretty surprising, like Kyle touched on. Um, you know, stage to stage, you can see one stage you're not getting a response on a monitor 1,000 feet away. The next, you'll see a fracture grow all the way out to a monitor 2,000 feet away. Um, so just the amount of stage level variability then within a stage when we have DAS and we can see multiple clusters, fractures reaching monitors, um, just the, again, amount of variation you can see uh, within individual clusters of a stage just has been, I think, really surprising and shown us, you know, we're not draining um, all the reservoir. Well, we know we weren't draining all the reservoir. We know we're, we were having, aren't having perfect cluster efficiency, but um, how poorly we might be doing it, especially on older jobs. I think it's been really insightful. Nice, uh, very nice. The uh, this seems to be very consistent with a lot of these uh, test sites and and uh, these uh, clinical Phillips papers as uh, as well. Uh, or to a little bit uh, going from a little bit broad, uh, or we can take one a little bit more broad question, and then we're going to go into some specifics here. So um, I guess I can ask this to to all of you. I guess so. Be a first come first serve. But uh, what are, are the changes that has been implemented due to your findings, and has this changed well counts, spacing, staggering, etc. I'll start it and then ask ask the guys to expand. But the one thing in the last 12, 18 months that's been really exciting to see is because we have so many data sets coming in, we get a lot of people that have the have the opportunity to work the analysis. So when you work the analysis, you have an appreciation for the calibration. When you understand what goes into the model, you have more respect and trust in what comes out of the model. So we're we're actively, repetitively going through this workflow of measuring geometry, calibrating our FRAC model, feeding it into the reservoir simulator, matching history, and then working with the integrated team to come up with scenarios to go trial. And then we're, believe it or not, drilling the scenarios. It sounds, it sounds silly to say that, but for a long time, when you don't have confidence in your model because you don't have enough calibration points, it's challenging to go make tens of millions of dollars of adjustments to your development strategy based on a model that you don't fully trust. So that's one of the big ones. We are making changes. Brendan, you can speak to some of the recent ones and how it's impacted the, the way the, the wells are planning to be drilled and completed. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. That's, that's, a, that's a really good point. And, and the confidence in the model, uh, I think just ties back to the, the number of iterations that you get and the number of reps that you get as a team when we start thinking about these uh, type of development decisions. And you know, it's, it's pretty eye-opening when you see uh, maybe some on-plane wells that, that don't show these interactions, and then you see maybe a stagger that shows it every single stage. So that kind of just gives us better images of these fracture morphologies. And, and Jackson does a really great job of showing a lot of this um, and how they grow in different benches. Um, you know, for me, growth rates have been a very surprising thing in the past is different basins your fracture could grow two or three times the speed uh, in other basins for, for similar jobs and volumes. So, uh, you know, obviously that impacts well spacing and that impacts your, your development pattern. Um, so, you know, in basins where we see the slowest fracture growth rates, we can accommodate tighter fracture spacing. In uh, basins where it's really, really fast, we, we are more sparse. So, um, yeah. Excellent. So, um... I'll do three, three, four more questions. I uh, have a, a lot of good ones here. Some are coming in the chat and some in the Q&A. Uh, so uh, the, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go for this one um, from, uh, from Chris Talley. Uh, have, you, have you done geomechanical sensitivities on BFRs, magnitudes, et cetera, to see if this specific data set can be applied to other basins? Or do you consider each formation unique, uh, you know, with a new baseline data set needed? Brendan. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, from the geomechanical perspective, um, the differences that we see in these uh, magnitudes of responses, I think are a direct function of, of the way the rock is breaking and, and, the, and the properties of the fracture and the properties of the geomechanics. So, you know, one example, you know, your regional stress anisotropy um, can control some of the, the growth rates and some of the kind of fracture you know, essentially behavior in, in the way it's propagating in the subsurface. So, you know, looking at those um, is, is, is quite important. And I think um, 
you know, doing sensitivities in the modeling space is is really important for us in this early stage to understand that. So, you know, I think in the in the front paper we'll have a, a parametric study that that shows what does you know not only your well bore links and well bore properties change, but what does net pressure look like on the sealed wall response? What does Young's modulus you know varying look like in the sealed wall response? So we're also looking into that, but um, you know, it's it's obviously a work in progress. This is fairly new research, so we, we're getting it out really early for you guys. Awesome. The, uh, yeah, okay. Can, uh, can you or have you used pressure responses in original frac to identify refract uh, candidates? I don't think that we've used it to identify candidates Brendan or Jackson, correct me if I'm off. We're, there's usually a different scoping technique to identify refract candidates, and this workflow is is not one of them. Good. And then last uh, last question, and we'll uh, call it uh, the meeting. Um, so. Um, so what if you could calibrate these findings into uh, the in the future with a tool that gives you frac size, length, stress measurements, net frac, you know, everything that you can essentially dream dream of, dream of when it comes to far and the near field uh, measurements? Uh, would that be highly valuable for further your, your calibrations? Was that a was that a Ronnie Pike question on maybe um, having some microseismic potentially there? Uh, if if that's the other data set. Then I can say yes, we like we like microseismic. It helps connect a lot of the dots. But we've also had different areas seeing different relationships. And I think that one of the things I was showing that reactivation that can be um, heard microseismically. Also, it's audible um, sometimes. Sometimes it's not audible. Um, so that's kind of introduced some uncertainty at times with our microseismic interpretation. We we feel like we need another diagnostic to to piece everything together, like strain monitor to get at kind of some of this uncertainty, but we definitely want, um, we still like microseismic for a lot of that three-dimensional understanding of, of what's going on. Perfect. So with that, I think we'll call it the meeting. I'll stop the recording and thanks again uh, to uh, to all of you uh, for uh, both the attending uh, attendees for sparing the time to, to join us today. And of course, uh, the, all the panelists has been been great. I definitely learned a lot uh, of new things and uh, really looking forward to where this is going in the in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it.